We began this year with a uh, journey through the Gospel of John. We are looking at Jesus and his glory, and we're learning to unpack that and what it means to us today. Today, he will be at a wedding. I do a lot of weddings. I've always enjoyed weddings. I've not had a wedding uh, that doesn't have a hiccup or two. It's just something that seems to go with weddings. You plan as hard as you can, and then you relax that day because somewhere in your plans, there's going to be a little problem uh, some of the things I've seen, I've had the feigning groomsmen's before. Uh, it's just, I try not to laugh, but when a big groomsman uh, faints and he hits this stage, it makes the most curious thump sound you've ever heard. And, uh, and I, you know, we're all ministering to them. I've seen uh, brides get the laughs and get uh, and cry. Uh, I've had both of those just uncontrollably. I had a bride who had the giggles so bad, and uh, and it just cracked me up because it came right when I said, "Do you take this man to be your husband?" And she starts giggling. That would make you lose a little confidence, probably. And uh, and then I had a dog one time in a wedding, and uh, uh, it's not something we any of us expected. It was in the backyard. It was for this couple and their family, and uh, as I was marrying them, uh, her dog came out and laid right at her feet, just laid down, and then fell into a, a deep, deep sleep, and then started snoring louder than any anyone I've ever heard snore before. And in that, I mean, it, it got to a point where it got my attention a little bit, and I stopped, and I looked down at the dog, and then she suddenly realized what was going on, and she's like, oh, I'm sorry. And she kicked the dog. He was like, yelp, and took off running, and the whole place fell apart. Took me forever to get everything under control again. Today, there's going to be a little hiccup in a wedding, and Jesus is at the wedding. In fact, Jesus is going to perform his first miracle at, at of all places, a wedding. There was a miracle at my wedding that Bonnie would say I do was a miracle, but it, thank you. And, uh, and today, Jesus, you would think the moment Jesus is saying, okay, it's, it's time for me to do a miracle, that his first one would be huge, that his first one would be spectacular, that it would involve thousands and thousands of people. That's not the case today. It's a very, very small community. This is going to be a very, very small, intimate event, and only, only a few dozen are going to get a chance to see this miracle come about. What is the miracle? He's going to turn water into wine. The minute you, you hear that, the minute I think about it, I think, really, water into wine? Is, is this really that important to all of us today? I mean, it feels like your first miracle could be something a little bit grander than just water into wine. We have done some spectacular things just as humans without any miraculous power. 1926, we had our very first color TV. 1954, we had our very first nuclear submarine. In 1967, we had our first heart transplant. In 1969, we put a man on the moon and brought him back. I mean, come on, how hard can it really be to turn water into wine? And in my mind, I start thinking, Jesus did bigger things than this. He restored sight to a blind man. He walked on water. He calmed a storm and just brought it to complete calmness. He raised people from the dead. And here in this moment, he's going to turn water into wine. Why? Why did he do it? Why did God want you to know that he did it? (laughs) And what does it mean for you and I today? Oh, there's lots of good historic background in this. We're going to unpack it real quick as we read through it. We're in John chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Here we go. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. 
What do we know about weddings in, in ancient time? We know that they lasted for about a week. It wasn't just a one-night event. It was a, a week-long celebration. We know that there were lots of parades uh, through town and around town with the couple. We know that most of the community was invited at some point to come in and to share in the celebration. But what we do know is this, is that the groom's family took care of all of the expenses. You know, I had two daughters that I helped through weddings. I wish I would have known this biblical practice that the groom's family paid the entire bill, which means if if the event ran out of food or wine, that that would be a huge embarrassment on that groom and on that family. And if they ran out of wine uh, during that week, it would be a stigma that would almost stay with that couple for the rest of their lives. People would always remember the wedding of that couple, the shame of that couple who ran out of wine. Wine was a huge thing inside this culture. And Mary is here, and Mary seems to immediately feel the shame of this moment. You might want to remember that Mary did not have the wedding of her dreams she was pregnant at her wedding, and, and most of the community knew that, and there was a shame that came with that that stayed with her her whole life. And in that moment <laughs> that all of this is unpacking, Mary identifies with it. She's not the master of the ceremony, but she kind of is feeling this for this poor family, for this poor groom in this story. She's feeling all of this And she does the one thing that she knew would make a difference. She goes to her son, Jesus. It's almost as if she's saying, today would be a good day for you to reveal yourself. I know who you really are. When you were born, the angel told me, you're the Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting for. You have power. And if there was ever a moment for you to reveal yourself, you could remove, now just thinking out loud, you could remove the shame for this groom. You could remove a shame I've lived with for 30 years by just showing your real self. That's why Mary has a big heart in this story. How does Jesus respond to his mom? It's awkward. Verse 4. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. Oh, my goodness. Woman, why do you involve me? When I was growing up, if my mom would have told me to do something, if I would have responded, woman, what? Why do you involve me? She would not have recognized I was quoting Jesus in that moment, all right? There would have been a wallop, and that's what would have happened, and uh, she would have missed the whole point. It sounds so disrespectful disrespectful in our time excuse me but back in that time it's just the opposite it could not have been more respectful back then publicly you would address even your mom as woman it's like saying ma'am or what we do sometimes sir with a a a man it would be like Downton Abbey's uh my lady it would be just like that Jesus Jesus always very respectfully treated women Even women who had questionable background. The woman at the well, Jesus says to her, Woman, a time is coming, he says. The woman who was caught in adultery, Jesus kneels down and says, Woman, where are your accusers? His mother at the cross, later on, he will say, Woman, behold your son. Mary Magdalene at the tomb of Jesus, he will say, woman, who are you looking for? To to use the word woman is not a diss, and Mary didn't take it that way at all. In fact, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. I love that. Mary didn't know what he would do. She didn't even know if he would do something. She just knew that she could count on Jesus doing the right thing. Oh, this is huge in our prayer life. When we're praying, we're asking Jesus to do something for us. You know, he might do something. He might. He might wait to do something. But the one thing you can always count on is he will do the right thing for you. 
it may be answering your prayer, it might not be, but he will do the right thing for you. And that is an amazing peace that falls over us in our prayer life. Well, what does Jesus do? Ah, oh, there's a miracle coming. Verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so here was my original plan, but then uh, I started feeling guilty about it, and I knew I'd be on live streaming, and so I didn't do it. I was going to go to Walmart and get six 30-gallon trash cans and put them up here so you could get a, a visual of six 30-gallon trash cans. But I also preach in the other end of the building, so I didn't need it 12 in order to cover that day. And then when the whole thing was done, I don't need 12 30-gallon trash cans, so I was going to pack them all up and take them back and get my money back. And that just didn't seem right to do or to admit on TV like I am today. But I need you to envision... Just, just imagine a large trash can, a 30-gallon trash can, six of them up here. Did they really need that much wine? They didn't run out in the first hours of the wedding. They didn't run out in the first days of the wedding. We're later in the week when those who are just traveling through and happen to be in the community like Jesus and his disciples, come on over, come over, get some food, come over and have some drink. And so it's late, but it's too early to run out of wine. And what Jesus is about to do in this moment is what we talk about when we read Psalm 23, my cup overflows. It just, there's an abundance there of what's about to happen. Did this couple need that much wine? I doubt it. Jesus then said to the servants, fill the jars with water so so they, will be fi so they filled them to the brim. Why did you need to know that detail? They were filled to the brim. So that you would know Jesus didn't add something to this. It's not a trick. They were filled to the brim with water one moment, and the very next moment, it was all wine. And not just average wine. Look at verse 8. Then he told them, now draw some out, take it to the master of the bank banquet. They did so. The master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn it, the water they knew. Verse 10, then he called the bridegroom aside, and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests, guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now hmm what Jesus did here was better than anything they had ever tasted before this is just speculation but what an amazing gift this would have been to that couple uh, six 30 gallon jars filled with wine the most spectacular wine anyone had ever tasted choice wine they wouldn't have needed that that whole week. They could have turned around at the end of the wedding and sold a bunch of that off. That much wine fills a 1,000 bottles of wine. It takes a, a ton of grapes to make a 1,000 bottles of wine. So a lot of effort went into this. What I in first envision as maybe just a small and maybe insignificant miracle is actually growing here in my mind. And then verse 11. What Jesus did here in Canaan of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Two reasons that Jesus does this miracle. To, so you would see his glory. And number two, so our faith would grow. So the ability to believe in him would grow. Uh, John tells us this is the first of the signs. I know there are apocrypha books out there. Some Bibles have extra books in them, books that didn't find it into the canonized version that you carry, and you probably always wondered why are there extra books. In those extra books, there are stories about Jesus doing miracles as a boy. John tells us, no, this was the first of his miracles. All right, so we'll see his glory, so our faith will grow. Is there anything else behind all of this? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Ancient Jews used to encourage one another to stay, hang in there, 
Don't give up. The Messiah is going to come one day. And when the Messiah comes, it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. It's going to be amazing. And one of the things they talked about was a celebration, an unbelievable, unmatched joy that would burst out when the Messiah got here. In fact, ancient Jews used to encourage one another with one day, one day when he gets here, boy, will the wine flow, they used to tell one another. And sure enough, in the surprise of surprises this week, as I was studying for this passage, in the Old Testament, it's right there. In the book of Joel, it says, in that day, the mountains will drip new wine. In Amos 9, it says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, new wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills one day one day there will be so much wine it'll be almost as if the mountains that are melting snow and those uh, rivers that come flooding down it's going to be like that much wine just coming on us isn't it curious that jesus first miracle is to have an abundance of wine created for you and i it points to the fact that he is the one he is the messiah but is that all i take from this passage And then this week, it, it, it just hit me, the, the word emptiness. Most of us know what empty feels like, don't we? We've all been there. Empty isn't much fun. There are people with us today who are struggling with empty right now. You have empty pockets or maybe empty refrigerators or maybe empty work prospects or maybe... Maybe there's some here today and you're struggling with an empty seat at the family table all of a sudden. And there's this level of emptiness that is just breaking our hearts. Imagine for a moment at this wedding, there's a group of people circled around an empty wine container and they're all looking down in it. There's the groom He's looking down into emptiness, and all he can see is his reputation is gone. There's guests there, and they're looking down in this empty wine container, and all they can see is disappointment. Well, I guess the party's over. Mary is there, and she looks down into that emptiness, and all she can see is the poor shame that is going to be put on this family, and she knows how that feels. And Jesus is there. And he's looking down into the emptiness and he's thinking, what a great place for a miracle. We all go through times of emptiness. I sometimes share with you, I'm transparent with you. There are times my spiritual cup is dangerously low. And I have to stop what I'm doing for I got to get away and deal with those serious moments of emptiness because if you stay empty too long that level of emptiness spiritually starts to lead to death out at kickapoo park there's a hollow tree when i first got here 14 years ago 15 years ago uh, that tree was still hollow my boys <laughs> they went in it and out of it it was a great big tree you could go in and out of the trunk because it was hollow but up at the top, there were still leaves. The leaves would still uh, grow each spring, and they'd change colors each fall. That tree is just a few meters away from fresh water. The roots have access to it. But without us really recognizing it, that, that hollowness, that emptiness inside the trunk was all leading to its death. And that tree died, and the last time I was out at the park, all the limbs at the top have been cut off. They, they left the tree there almost as a memorial to it. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm right, it's still there. But everything that was dangerous that could fall on you has been cut away now. That tree is dead. It's not going to come back to life. Uh, being hollow and empty for too long is dangerous. It's not good for us doesn't matter doesn't always mean that you've done something wrong it just means you're human if you're in the midst of some level of emptiness we all are there at times and empty can be just 
just agonizing. Oh, just stay busy, they tell you. Stay busy. As if having a full schedule meant you had a full life. That's not the case, is it? You can be very busy people and still deep inside struggle with emptiness. What do you do with it? I was talking with Casey Lohr. He's one of our uh, staff members here. And Casey said it so very, very well. As we were talking about this passage and I was sharing with him some of my struggles in there. He said, you know what? He said, Jesus either uh, fills the emptiness or he works in the emptiness. And I love that. Jesus is either going to fill my emptiness or he's going to work in my emptiness until my time for my miracle comes. And there's a filling that takes place. I do know this. In the midst of our emptiness, you avoid spiritual death by staying strongly connected to Jesus. And, and he may ask you to wait for a while. He often does. My wife uh, waits until the gas light comes on in her car. Now, now, why is that important? Because uh, in our marriage, she's asked me to do a few things for her. I do all the garbage. My wife doesn't touch garbage. She's like, no man who loves his wife should ever ask her to touch nasty garbage. So I do all the garbage. She's also asked me, can you keep my uh, car filled? Because uh, it's cold outside half the time or weather and everything. It would just be nice if I didn't have to worry about it. I said, no problem. Just let me know when you're down to a quarter of the tank, and I'll fill your car. And she's into some kind of evil game uh, that I call, let's see if Ron can get to the gas station on empty. It's, it's just a game she likes to play, and I know she's thinking of me. You know, if he runs out of gas, he'll have this great sermon illustration. You know, it's, it's for me, but... You know, it's just so irritating. And, and then when the light comes on, sometimes it, she, she forgets to tell me. And it's a couple of days. Let, oh, by the way, the gas light's on. It's been that way for two days. Oh, hope you make it. <laughs> and so I go out and I get in the car. And I laugh to myself and I wag my head and I start it. And in that moment, I know. No side trips. Don't waste any time. You need to make a beeline to the closest station you can. When, when I'm empty, I know I shouldn't waste too much time in that moment because it's real dangerous to stay empty for too long. And so I make a beeline for Jesus, trusting that he's either going to fill my emptiness or he's going to work in my emptiness for a while. For everyone who's listening to my message today, I just want to say, your miracle is probably closer than you realize. So just believe and trust, give it to Jesus, and wait. If he leaves you empty for a little while, that's okay because he's working in that emptiness too. But your filling, your miracle filling is on its way.